Chapter twenty two of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter twenty two. Pancakes. Half an hour later, Ralph, having seen Miss Nancy Sawyer's machinery of warm baths and simple remedies safely in operation, and having seen the roan colt comfortably stabled, and rewarded for his faithfulness by a bountiful supply of the best hay and the promise of oats when he was cool, half an hour later, Ralph was doing the most ample, satisfactory, and amazing justice to his Aunt Matilda's hot buckwheat cakes and warm coffee. And after his life in Flat Creek, Aunt Matilda's house did look like paradise. How white the tablecloth, how bright the coffee-pot, how clean the woodwork, how glistening the brass doorknobs, how spotless everything that came under the sovereign sway of Mrs. Matilda White. For in every Indiana village as large as Lewisburg, there are generally a half-dozen women who are admitted to be the best housekeepers. All others are only imitators, and the strife is between these for the preeminence. It is at least safe to say that no other in Lewisburg stood so high as an enemy to dirt, and as a rat, roach, and mouse exterminator, as did Mrs. Matilda White, the wife of Ralph's maternal uncle, Robert White, Esquire, a lawyer in successful practice. Of course, no member of Mrs. White's family ever stayed at home longer than was necessary. Her husband found his office, which he kept in as bad a state as possible in order to maintain an equilibrium in his life, much more comfortable than the stiffly clean house at home. From the time that Ralph had come to live as a chore boy at his uncle's, he had ever crossed the threshold of Aunt Matilda's temple of cleanliness with a horrible sense of awe. And Walter Johnson, her son by a former marriage, had, poor weak-willed fellow, been driven into bad company and bad habits by the wretchedness of extreme civilization. And yet he showed the hereditary trait, for all the genius which Mrs. White consecrated to the glorious work of making her house too neat to be habitable. Her son Walter gave to tying exquisite knots in his colored cravats, and combing his oiled locks so as to look like a dandy barber. And she had no other children. The kind providence that watches over the destiny of children takes care that very few of them are lodged in these terribly clean houses. But Walter was not at the table, and Ralph had so much anxiety, lest his absence should be significant of evil, that he did not venture to inquire after him as he sat there between Mr. and Mrs. White, disposing of Aunt Matilda's cakes, with an appetite only justified by his long morning's ride, and the excellence of the brown cakes, the golden honey, and the coffee, enriched, as Aunt Matilda's always was, with the most generous cream. Aunt Matilda was so absorbed in telling of the doings of the Dorcas Society that she entirely forgot to be surprised at the early hour of Ralph's arrival. When she had described the number of the garments finished to be sent to the Five Points Mission, or the Home for the Friendless, or the South Sea Islands, I forget which, Ralph thought he saw his chance, while Aunt Matilda was in a benevolent mood to broach a plan he had been resolving for some time. But when he looked at Aunt Matilda's immaculate, horribly immaculate, housekeeping, his heart failed him, and he would have said nothing had she not inadvertently opened the door herself. "'How did you get here so early, Ralph?' And Aunt Matilda's face was shadowed with a coming rebuke. "'By early rising,' said Ralph. But seeing the gathering frown on his aunt's brow, he hastened to tell the story of Shockey as well as he could. Mrs. White did not give way to any impulse toward sympathy, until she learned that Shockey was safely housed with Miss Nancy Sawyer. "'Yes, Sister Sawyer has no family cares,' she said by way of smoothing her slightly ruffled complacency. "'She has no family cares, and she can do those things. Sometimes I think she lets people impose on her, and keep her away from the means of grace. And I spoke to our new preacher about it the last time he was here.' and asked him to speak to Sister Sawyer about staying away from the ordinances to wait on everybody. But he is a queer man, and he only said that he supposed Sister Sawyer neglected the inferior ordinances, that she might attend to higher ones. But I don't see any sense in a minister of the gospel calling prayer meeting a lower ordinance than feeding catnip to Mrs. Brown's last baby. But hasn't this little boy, shocking, or what do you call him, got any mother? Yes, said Ralph and that was just what I was going to say. And he proceeded to tell how anxious Shockey was to see his half-blind mother, and actually ventured to wind up his remarks by suggesting that Shockey's mother, 
be invited to stay over Sunday in Aunt Matilda's house. "'Bless my stars!' said that astounded saint. "'Fetch a pauper here? What crazy notions you have got! Fetch her here out of the poor house? Why, she wouldn't be fit to sleep in my—' Here Aunt Matilda choked. The bare thought of having a pauper in her billowy beds, whose snowy whiteness was frightful to any ordinary mortal, the bare thought of the contagion of the poorhouse taking possession of one of her beds, smothered her. And then, you know, sore eyes are very catching. Ralph boiled a little. Aunt Matilda, do you think Dorcas was afraid of sore eyes? It was a center shot, and the lawyer uncle, lawyer-like, enjoyed a good hit. And he enjoyed a good hit at his wife best of all, for he never ventured on one himself. But Aunt Matilda felt that a direct reply was impossible. She was not a lawyer, but a woman, and so dodged the question by making a countercharge. It seems to me, Ralph, that you have picked up some very low associates. And you go around at night, I am told. You get over here by daylight, and I hear that you have made common cause with a lame soldier who acts as a spy for thieves, and that your running about of night is likely to get you into trouble. Ralph was hit this time. I suppose, he said, that you've been listening to some of Henry Small's lies. Why, Ralph, how you talk! The worst sign of all is that you abuse such a young man as Dr. Small, the most exemplary Christian young man in the county, and he is a great friend of yours, for when he was here last week he did not say a word against you, but looked so sorry when your being in trouble was mentioned. Didn't he, Mr. White? Mr. White, as in duty bound, said yes, but he said yes in a cool lawyer-like way, which showed that he did not take quite so much stock in Dr. Small as his wife did. This was a comfort to Ralph, who sat picturing to himself the silent flattery which Dr. Small's eyes paid to his Aunt Matilda, and the quiet expression of pain that would flit across his face when Ralph's name was mentioned. And never until that moment had Hartsook understood how masterful Small's artifices were. He had managed to elevate himself in Mrs. White's estimation, and to destroy Ralph at the same time, and had managed to do both by a contraction of the eyebrows. But the silence was growing painful, and Ralph thought to break it, and turn the current of talk from himself by asking after Mrs. White's son. "'Where is Walter?' "'Oh, Walter's doing well. He went down to Clifty three weeks ago to study medicine with Henry Small. He seems so fond of the doctor, and the doctor is such an excellent man, you know, and I have strong hopes that Wally will be led to see the error of his ways by his association with Henry.' I suppose he would have gone to see you but for the unfavorable reports that he heard. I hope, Ralph, you too will make the friendship of Dr. Small. And for the sake of your poor dead mother. Here Aunt Matilda endeavored to show some emotion. For the sake of your poor dead mother. But Ralph heard no more. The buckwheat cakes had lost their flavor. He remembered that the colt had not yet had his oats. And so, in the very midst of Aunt Matilda's affecting allusion to his mother— like a stiff-necked reprobate that he was, Ralph Hartsook rose abruptly from the table, put on his hat, and went out toward the stable. "'I declare,' said Mrs. White, descending suddenly from her high moral standpoint, "'I declare that boy has stepped right on the threshold of the back door.' And she stuffed her white handkerchief into her pocket, and took down the floor-cloth to wipe off the imperceptible blemish left by Ralph's boot-heels. And Mr. White followed his nephew to the stable, to request that he would be a little careful what he did about anybody in the poorhouse, as any trouble with the Joneses might defeat Mr. White's nomination to the judgeship of the Court of Common Pleas. End of chapter 22